thank you for your word this morning. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to see the truths that you've given us this morning to, to teach us, Lord, the things in your word. Enlighten our mind, speak to our heart, Lord, and change us and make us more into your image. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Back in the 1500s, a, uh, a fastidious monk who by his own testimony, he hated God, was studying Paul's epistle here to the Romans. And he couldn't get past uh, the first half of Romans in Romans 1.17, where it says this is the righteous of, righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And that one simple biblical truth it changed the monk's life, and it ignited what we know as the, uh, the, Re the Reformation. Uh, it really was a life-changing thing for him, and when he realized that it was God's righteousness could become the sinner's righteousness, and that could happen through the means of faith alone, it changed everything. And Martin Luther found in that one verse, in 117, the truth he'd been stumbling over, all that true Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And he describes this breakthrough as he goes through it. What happened to him inside when he finally realized what this really said? And I'm going to read it to you in just a second, but I want you to understand what we're talking about here this morning. We've been going through the gospel called Gospel 101. This is the heart of the gospel. So listen close. He describes this breakthrough that put an end to the theological dark ages, and he says, I saw the connection between the justice of God and the statement that the just shall live by his faith. Then I grasped that the justice of God is that righteousness by which, through grace and sheer mercy, God justifies us through faith. Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. The whole of Scripture took on a new meaning. And whereas before the justice of God had filled me with hate, now it became to me inexpressibly sweet in greater love. This passage of Paul became to me a gate to heaven. The question this morning we're going to ask in just a minute, just as we go through this, is how can a man or woman, boy or girl, be made righteous and be right with God? I mean, that's the question. And for Luther, Luther, Luther was looking for righteousness because in his heart, he's like all of us. He knew he was guilty. He was guilty before God, before God and that guilt led him to, to really just hate God. And there are a lot of people out there like that because they feel so guilty. They feel like God is an ogre out to get them, and they hate God. That's the way Luther was. But none of the things that he did, because he was in the Catholic Church, he did, he did things to, to make himself feel like he was acceptable. None of the things that he did gave him any sort of peace. And I'd, I would suggest to us this morning that everyone, everyone knows that they're guilty before God. How can a man be made right with God? That's the problem. And it's the question every religion has. You think about it. Every religion in the world, everyone, they're out to see themselves be made right before a God whatever God they call God. 99 out of 100, except for Christianity, will teach that you can be right by doing good things. If you just do enough good things. You know, back in Paul's day, he ran across a group of people who had all kinds of gods that they worshipped in Athens, Greece. He came to this group of people, and they had so many gods that they named one of the gods an unknown God. They didn't know who it was. They just thought, well, since we're worshiping all these gods, we might as well include one that we might not know about in Acts 17. And he goes to this group and he says, you know, I know who you're worshiping. You don't know who it is, but let me tell you about him. And you see, everybody in, in the world worships something. They might not know who it is. And this group of people, they knew that there was something outside of themselves that was greater than who they were that they had to give acknowledgement to and who they are accountable to. So every religion has this awareness. And we see it behind every human attempt, I believe, to be good, to be moral, to do the right things. People adopt this philosophy, and you and I have heard it about God, that if I do enough good, if I just do enough good, it will outweigh the bad that I do. God will accept me. And so I involve myself 
in moral activities and work really hard to improve myself, then I can prove that God accepts me and it's okay. I tip the scales in my favor. And we hear things like this, well, I'm, I think I'm a pretty good person. You ever heard that? Or I always do the best I can. I try to live a decent life. Or maybe this, I sleep at night. My conscience doesn't bother me. Well, let me tell you, Jiminy Crickets, his advice that he got from the Blue Fairy, <laughs> it's not any good. Your conscience, you, you can't let your conscience be your God because your conscience just, it just goes by what it's been taught. Romans 2.15 tells us that the conscience of man outside of Christ is unreliable. It sometimes accuses us at, and at other times it even defends us. So we have no clue about what right, right and wrong is. Every effort at self-improvement is deceptive. Tony Robbins can't awaken the giant within. Joel Osteen cannot make your best life happen now. Sorry. We all have a big problem. How can a man be made right with God? Well, let me tell you, here's the thing. Here's the thing I want you to get this morning. It's simply this. You cannot be right with God without the righteousness of God. Let me give you just a little context to our passage this morning. Paul has just spent the first three chapters of up to verse 20, where we are this, in this letter to say this, from the most immoral person to the most moral person, to the, to the most unly God, ungodly person, to the, to the most religious person. No one can be right with God by the things that they do. He spent whole three chapters trying to, to tell people, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how good you think you are, how good the person you, you know might be or how bad they are, no one is acceptable and righteous before God. And that's why in verse 20, Paul makes this conclusion. Look at it in your verses, if you have your Bible there, about every person. Verse 20 of chapter 3, By works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. In other words, you can never do enough or be good enough to make yourself right with God. And, and the reason, all that standard does, it's called the law, is all it does is to tell each of us, God's holy and you're not. That's all the law does. So we pick up the verses in verse 21, and the opening words of the, the thought, which is introduced really in chapter 1, 16 and 17, where he, he says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. He's already talked about that. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about that very question. How has the righteousness of God been revealed? Let's look at it. I want to give you, I just want to give these things to you in four specific features. How the righteousness of God has been revealed to you and to me. Number one, the first thing Paul says, it was planned from eternity. It was planned from eternity. He says, but now... And it's almost like all the stuff we've been learning in chapter 3, 1 through 3, all the stuff that tells us how bad we were, all the stuff we saw last week about being dead in your sins, it's all changed. When Christ comes on the scene, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested. The word the is not even there in your text. If it says the righteousness, it says a righteousness, as if it is a different kind of righteousness than yours. It's been manifested. Fenerao in the word is the Greek word. The word has this idea in it, something that's been brought to light. It's almost like if you picture someone on a stage who's been out in the shadows and all at once the spotlight comes on to this person. It's been brought to light. And the thought is that God's righteousness has been brought to light in time and in history through the person of Jesus Christ and God had this plan from eternity, all the way back from before the world began. Listen to what the Word says in 1 Peter. He says, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was manifested, same word, in these last times for your sake. He was brought to light. He was coming out of the shadows, and no one knew about this righteousness that would help them get over their works and their efforts. 
Christ comes on the scene, the light is shed on, shined on him. And we might picture, as I say, a stage. And the play that's going on is a tragedy. It was the Roman poet Horace who criticized writers of tragedies in his day. And he gave them some advice. He said, do not bring a god onto the stage unless the problem is one that, a de that deserves a god to solve it. Well, God brought Christ onto the stage of human history because he solves the problem. This righteousness of God is, as he says, it's apart from law. It's, it's not based on anything that you can do. And it's interesting, the word order in the Greek starts with that phrase, apart from the law. This righteousness is revealed. Why is that important? Because he wants you to understand there isn't anything you can do. You're in trouble. I'm in trouble. It's a righteousness that comes from God. It's a righteousness that forgives your sin. It's the, the righteousness that you cannot earn. And then he says, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. See, all through the Old Testament, all that God had done from past eternity, he's given the message of his coming to these who are called the law, the, the law itself and the prophets. They bear witness to it, and we can see it. The law, it, it witnessed to it. And you think about it, the law provided a system of, of uh, sacrifices and, and offerings, and when they brought a lamb to be slain, it was a picture of the, 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 the Christ who was come to be slain before the foundation of the world. It was pictured in all those sacrifices that the Old Testament saints spent their time and every moment thinking about. John 1 says, this witness to mankind was that, that of the one coming who will be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The law witnessed to it. The prophets witnessed to it. You may remember what Jesus said about Abraham, which is really amazing. I saw this scripture and I was just like still blown away. This example, your father Abraham rejoiced, Jesus said, that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Old Testament saints seen Christ from way back then. They testified to it. Abraham, Moses, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, others. They not only talked about the gift, but what they, they experienced. Our model for faith is Abraham. You ever wonder, how did the Old Testament saints get saved? That's a good question. How did Old Testament saints get saved? Well, they did a lot of stuff and they worked real hard. No! Same way we do, through faith in the person of Jesus Christ. This righteousness was not only planned from eternity. There's a second thing I want you to see. It is provided, it is provided through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what verses 23, 22 and 23 say. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. You see, this faith that's offered is only available if you place it in the right object. The object is a person. People talk about, well, you just need to have faith. Faith won't get you anywhere if it's not in this person. Don't miss the words, for all who believe. Do we, uh, do we really understand that? I wonder. We talk about believing in Jesus. But this is not just some mental assent. This is just... This is not some acknowledgement that, that Jesus did what he did, that he, that he was born, that he died, he was buried, and he rose again. And we know that truth. You know what? The demons believe that. They know that, James says. So believing is more than that. Believing is to so trust in Jesus that you stake your life on him. To believe in Jesus is to build your world around him. To believe in Jesus is to give up your whole life to receive his. That's what believing means. It was a late A.W. Tozer who commented that the faith of Paul and Luther was a revolutionizing thing. It upset the whole life of the individual and made him into another person altogether. It laid hold on the life and brought it unto obedience to Christ. It took up its cross and followed after Jesus with no intention of going back. It said goodbye to its old friends as certainly as Elijah when he stepped into the fiery chariot and went away in the whirlwind. It had a finality about it. It snapped shut on a man's heart like a, like a trap. 
It captured the man and made him from that moment forward a happy love servant of the Lord. So believing is more than just, yeah, I acknowledge that you're there. We stake our life on him. Anyone who believes in Jesus Christ, placing the trust in him, will receive this righteousness that Paul talks about this morning. Anyone. Anyone. Jesus himself said, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And I, I wonder this morning, there may be some here this morning who feel like, and you just don't deserve this righteousness. And you, you feel guilty. And uh, if you said, I feel guilty, you'd be absolutely correct if you're not in Christ. We are all guilty without him. He goes on, he said, why is that? Because there's no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We, none of us, measure up. None of us can, can reach the bar. Say, so what is the bar? Jesus told us in Matthew 5, he said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Anybody perfect in, in here? Raise your hand. Say, so how do you get perfect? You have faith in Christ, who is your perfection. So this righteousness... It was something we, we gained through faith. It is something we gained through faith. And there's a third thing. This righteousness, it was purchased by Christ. And here's where it starts to get really good. And I want you to pay close attention. He says that we were, that, that being justified by his grace is a gift. Being justified, it refers all the way back to this idea where it's included. It says all. All sinned. All were justified for all who placed their faith in Christ. So being justified, we need to kind of understand this in the context it's put in, because the word is a forensic term, it's a legal term. It describes what God declares about you, not what he does to change you if you're a believer. Did you get that? It's not what he does to change you, it's a declaration about you. See, sanctification is about changing you. That's, that's something else. Justification is what we're talking about here. That's a declaration of what God says about you. Your state. So we put this context in what we might say, let's just think of it as a courtroom drama. Think of that. A lot of us have been in a courtroom, maybe for, for a good reason, not a bad. But here God is the judge. And everyone, everyone is on trial for a heinous crime. And you and I deserve death. You're standing before this judge. And the Bible says that this judge in Genesis 18 is called the judge of all the earth who is said to do right. In other words, he's said to do right because people know this judge has a good reputation. You ever known any judges that didn't have such a good reputation? You didn't want to be standing in front of them, right? Or you didn't want to know someone that was close to you to have to be judged by an unrighteous judge. But this judge is a righteous judge. And we can all be thankful for that. Now, what does a judge do? Judge has one job, right? Assess the evidence presented and pass a sentence. Give a verdict. The evidence for everyone of, uh, of every one of us is the same. We deserve death. We are dead. <laughs> We're all guilty because of sin. And yet what God does in justifying the believer is to stand there and say to you, to me, not guilty. Last week, Jessica Evans, if you know her, one of our members, she got married. Some of you got to go to the wedding. Uh, when the rings had been exchanged and the vows had been given, the minister who was standing up there, he gave the words, I now pronounce you husband and man and wife, husband and wife, man and wife. Same, same concept here. In the same way, ju uh, God is, is basically making a pronouncement about you. And it changes your status forever. Before God, not guilty. And he says, you are fully righteous. That not only means that you're pronounced righteous, but God treats you that way too. 
That's what justification entails. It doesn't just say, well, I'm just going to call you a righteous person. He actually treats you that way, and you get all the benefits and all the blessings of being a righteous, just person. You can't do anything to deserve it. I can't do anything to deserve it. It's a gift of God's grace, and it's divine favor toward who? Those who believe. And unlike any other verdict, this verdict is creative because guess what? God, when he once called us enemies, he now calls us friends. And more than that, he calls us sons and daughters. There's all kinds of things that happen because you are declared righteous. That's why in Paul, later on, he says in Romans 8, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. No more condemnation. That is, if you feel like you're just a toad, (laughs) it's a lie if you're in Christ. Now, I've met a lot of Christians who feel that way. And they go around and they, seem to, they don't understand this truth that Paul is talking about here. And sometimes in their struggle with sin, they live under this load of guilt. Unable to have any confidence in a lie. And they're in bondage to a lie. To this false perception. God doesn't like me. God doesn't like me very much and so he's against me. If you're in Christ, that's a lie, folks. You are righteous, and he sees you that way. When he looks at you, he sees his son, Jesus. He sees the righteousness of Christ. So that truth of justification, it frees us from all the condemnation that we often feel. Now notice the second half of that verse, verse 24. The only way we could be justified, he said, was through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There's another word, redemption. We might not know what that means. It had its origins in, in uh, when they would release prisoners of war. And later on, it was a word that meant to free, a, free up a, a, a slave who was in the slave market. In our courtroom example, let's go back to that in just a minute. Now the judge has declared you righteous. But somebody's got to pay, right? If this is going to be a righteous judge, he can't just let you off the hook. Or else he's not a righteous judge. So, what does he do? His son is sitting right next there to the the bench. He says, son, stand up. And he pushes you out of the way. And he said, son, take their place. With the guilty. So you are forgiven. And you go free. And the judge's son pays the ultimate price. That's redemption. As one commentator said, man is a slave to sin. Man cannot be righteous on his own, and God provides a righteousness by faith. The only way God can do that is for Christ to pay the, the price to free that man. The man is a prisoner. He is sentenced to die. Somebody's got to pay his penalty. And that was the, the redeeming price paid by the blessed Lord Jesus Christ. He paid the price to set us all free. How does God's righteousness, how has it been revealed? Well, it's been revealed from eternity past. It's been provided through our faith. It was purchased by Christ. And then last, I want you to see this. This is the most exciting. It was proven at the cross. It was proven at the cross. Verses 25 and 26. He talks about whom God put forward. They say, whom is whom? <laughs> you got to go back to the previous verse. It's Jesus. Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, another hard word, by his blood to be received by faith. And this is rich. There's so much here. But I want you to understand what God did, because this changes everything. At the cross, God's full wrath, it was poured out on the one who took your place, the God-man who took my place. So Paul tells us first that he he put Christ forward. So we could pass over that really quickly. But there's something that I want you to see. He put Christ forward. It means to display publicly. 
It was often used when, uh, when someone was, was taken and uh, like a body that lies in state. We've been and seen on television when a president has died and they put his body in state and, and all the, the people in Washington come by in the rotunda and they, they, they go by and pay their respects. They see the, the guy who's died. He's on public display. And what God did in Christ is for Christ at the cross... He put him on display. We hear Christ through the psalmist. When Christ says through that psalmist, I am an object of scorn to my accusers. When they see me, they wag their heads. Christ is on display. And where? On the cross. See, the, the gospel, folks, was not done in a corner. It wasn't something that was hidden away because God didn't want you to see it. He wanted you to have the full Monty, he wants you to see everything. It wasn't done in the shadows. It was presented so all of us could see. The crucifixion was an official public execution. The death of Christ was on public display. Why did, say, why did, God, why did God do that? Well, the key to the verse is that word, that hard word. As a propitiation, hilasterion in the Greek. It comes from another Hebrew word that just that, that referred to something we all maybe have heard about. It was, it was a reference to that Ark of the Covenant and that lid that covered the Ark of the Covenant. And if you know anything about what they did, the, the high priest once a year would go into the Holy of Holies behind the veil and he would, he would throw blood all over the top of that mercy seat, is what it was called, the hilasterion. And by doing so, it covered or atoned for the people's sins. Same word here. And Paul is trying to get, to, get, get us to understand that same word is applied to the cross. James Edwards, in his commentary on this verse, writes this, Paul's use of hilasterion is itself a model of a high priest throwing blood from a sacrificial victim on a holy place in order to remove the sins of those for whom it was offered. The sinner has absolutely nothing to bring to appease God's wrath, but God, out of his fathomless love and holiness, gives what the sinner cannot give, namely, himself on the sinner's behalf. Do you see the power in that? And God wants the cross to be on display so he can show you and me that he paid his life, he poured out his blood to pay for our sins. Last thing, and notice the purpose of it, of God putting Christ on display. He said this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That word show just means to prove. So God's proving something here. He's proving his righteousness. How righteous is God? It says in the past he passed over former sins in his divine forbearance. What does that word mean? Another hard word. Last one. <laughs> but it's a hard one. Forbearance just simply means that he waited, he delayed, then why did he do that? Because the cross had not yet come. Jesus had not yet died. And all those in the Old Testament who had sinned, he delayed out of his mercy. He waited. Now, if you're a judge, and you, or if you're a person who, who looks at a judge, and you, you see the judge never, never doing anything about something that's wrong, you would think the judge was, what? Unrighteous? So in order that you don't get the wrong idea, he tells us, Paul tells us, he held back, but he didn't so that the cross could be real to all of us, and especially to those Old Testament saints. So he waited to pour his wrath out, because they wouldn't have benefited. F.F. F. Bruce writes, to pass over wrong is as much an act of injustice on the part of the judge as to condemn the innocent. So, so God didn't ignore it forever. He didn't pass over the sins forever. God's righteousness then would have been in question. But God, with the cross, poured out his wrath 
And then he says in the present, not just in the past, God proved his righteousness to the one who has faith in Jesus. So this is really his promise to you. This is his integrity to you. God is a righteous judge. And if you believe in him, you'll get his righteousness. The righteousness of God. This is almost incomprehensible, but, but it's the best news you all to, uh, say you've ever heard. This is why this is the good news. Because there's no other way for you and me to be right with God. How can a man be right with God? Through faith in Jesus Christ. You know, I want us to stand. I want to pray for us this, this morning because I think the one thing that we all need and the one thing that we all need to, to be certain of is not only that we have that righteousness available to us, but that we have forgiveness because that's what the cross brings let's pray and i want to ask god on behalf of all of us to help us get this truth father i thank you for the truth that you've given us this morning out of your word lord it has power you tell us it has authority and it can it can break rocks and break stone i pray that you would break our hearts father with the truth of this message lord teach us that we through the cross by believing in you lord we have forgiveness of sins and more, Lord, that we have been made righteous when we aren't. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted in Christ, you know you're guilty. You know you're a sinner. This is God's gift to you. And I invite you this morning, and we've got a prayer team that will be meeting in the back, to go talk to them and find out how this Jesus can be known in, known in a personal way. That you're you're. Your sins can be forgiven, and you can enter into a relationship with him that will change your life. If you're here this morning, you feel condemned. You just feel like, man, my life is just messed up, and God could, he just never can forgive me. I don't know what you've done. But if you're feeling condemned, God tells you, you are righteous in Christ. And I pray, Father, for these folks that have that feeling this morning that you would give them a confidence of these truths. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.